Welcome, this is Anna, and we are going to start um, moving through some more of our um, lectures that go with the uh, central nervous system and brain chapters. This one is going to look at part five, this, uh, which is focusing on the cerebral spinal fluid and the blood brain barrier. Don't forget that you do have the lecture on meninges in a separate file, and you probably want to watch that one before you watch this one. All right, let's start off looking a little bit closer at um, a sinus, a, a sagittal sinus, for example, the sagittal sinus, um, and how the meninges are coming together with this. So remember, if you don't remember what your dura mater is, you really need to go back and look at that before you continue on with this particular lecture. So here you can see the bone of the, of the uh, uh, parietal bone or whatever. And then you've got the periosteal layer of the dura mater, and you've got the meningeal layer of the dura mater. So remember, periosteal is up against the bone. Now, anywhere that's not a sinus, this layer and this layer are closely adhered to together. But to create this kind of um, facsimile of a vein, so it's, it's acting like a vein, but it isn't a vein. To create this facsimile, you separate the periosteal layer from the meningeal layer, and then the sagittal sinus um, can act like a vein. Okay, now down here you've got the brain tissue itself, you've got a little bit of pia mater here, and then this is where you've got the, men, uh, the arachnoid matter, and this is gonna be filled with cerebral spinal fluid in between these little strands, which are connecting it up with the pia mata down there. Now, if we take the arachnoid matter, so remember, this is dura mater. So this is a fibrous CT. This arachnoid matter is essentially punching up through that meningeal layer, and then it's got its membrane here and then what you see is blood surrounding it. So this is deoxygenated blood, so they're representing it as blue, okay? So, but this is all filled with cerebral spinal fluid. Now, with this simple squamous epithelium right here, you can basically send the fluid of the CSF through that into the venous blood supply. Okay, so remember the CSF is being produced by those ependymal cells. But it's constantly being produced, so that means you have to get rid of it. Well, this is how you get rid of it, all right? You let it diffuse um, into the blood. Um, and it's gonna do that via what is called arachnoid feli, felis for singular. So this is an arachnoid felis right there, okay? All right, let's look at the next slide. Now, we need to basically be collecting the cerebral spinal fluid that we're making in the ependymal cells. So remember the CSF is made and ependymal cells, and you're gonna find these concentrations of ependymal cells in various places where you're making it. Now, the CSF then gets collected into what are called ventricles and then to some other spaces. So you need to look at the two different views here. So this is a sagittal view, okay? And this is an anterior view. And you need to memorize these structures. So I have a lateral ventricle and a lateral ventricle. I have the intervertebral, excuse me, interventricular foramen, which is then going to go into the third ventricle, and then that's going to go down the cerebral aqueduct into the fourth ventricle. I have little apertures, which will take it to the outside so that you can get it into the subarachnoid space. And if you've forgotten what that is, go watch the meninges video. All right, and then of course, it'll go down the center through the spinal canal or the central canal. And then over here, again, you've got lateral ventricle, 
you have the foramen right here. This is the third ventricle, which remember surrounds the diencephalon. You've got the cerebral aqueduct, the fourth ventricle, the spinal canal, okay, or central canal. All right, let's look at, um, let's, let's go over some notes. All right, so we looked at the previous slide at pictures of these ventricles. So what you need to remember is what they are. These are basically chambers filled with cerebral spinal fluid. Now, when we show them on models or representations, we, we show them as more solid than they actually are. They're obviously a very liquidy structure, and when you cut into a brain, all the liquid goes away. Okay. Um, but they're basically there um, and full of cerebral spinal fluid. Um, all right. So they are formed from the lumen of your embryonic nubitule. So when you start making the embryonic neural tube is going to start folding and the very lumen of it in the very center is going to be left to make those ventricles. What's nice about the ventricles is that they're all continuous which means they start in one spot and then they flow into each other. Okay, So they're continuous with each other plus the subarachnoid space and the spinal canal, which is also called the central canal, okay? Um, now, where are they made? All right, so where is the fluid made? So where is CSF made? I've already mentioned that the cell is the ependymal cells, and we looked at those before when we were studying the very beginning of the nervous system chapter and looking at the histology, okay? Now the ependymal cells will be clustered into these little packages that we call choroid plexi. All right, choroid plexus is singular, plexi is plural, okay? So they'll be on the floor of a ventricle and the choroid plexus, which is made up of ependymal cells, will be secreting the CSF. So ependymal cells secrete CSF, okay? They also have cilia, which creates a current to move the CSF, okay? So it's got this nice little flow. Um, now, in terms of locations, you had that on that previous slide. What I want you to think about are the two lateral ventricles and those will be found in each cerebral hemisphere, so a right and a left. So you've got a right and a left, okay? The third ventricle, I'm just going to abbreviate that V, is going to be under or inferior to the corpus callosum. And then the fourth ventricle is going to be between the pons and the cerebellum, okay, but but within the brainstem, okay, so it's not actually part of the cerebellum, it's within the brainstem. And then you got to connect these things up, which you're going to do with um, the intervertebral foramen and the cere um sorry, let me write that, inter, no, not the intervertebral foramen. Hold on a second. I'm blanking. What's the word? Mm, oh, interventricular. In, interventricular. Ventricular foramen. And the cerebral aqueduct. Okay. All right, so what I did right there is I kind of drew it out as notes. Another way to do this is kind of make a visual representation. So I've got a lateral ventricle over here and a lateral ventricle over here. These are each located in a cerebrum. So you could say that um, you've got the left cerebrum over here and you've got the right cerebrum over here, okay? Between the two, there is a barrier that we call the septum 
pellucidum um, or pellucidum. Either pronunciation is fine. Okay, so this is a wall that separates them. Okay, now I need them to flow. So I'm going to draw it like this. And this is where I'm going to have that interventricular foramen. Okay. I'm going to abbreviate that IF so I don't have to write it out all the way on the other side. So the IF. Okay. Now these all flow then into the third ventricle, which is um, part of the diencephalon. So it's basically surrounding the thalamus. Okay. That is where it's located. So it's going into this structure right here. Now that needs to flow down and it's gonna do that via the cerebral aqueduct, okay? So this is another tube. It's gonna come down and that's gonna flow into the fourth ventricle, which is basically just dorsal to the pons within the brainstem, okay? And so you've got this, and then that flows down into the central canal or the spinal canal, okay? Now that's the internal structures, but you still need to get this out into the subarachnoid space. So we're gonna use these little apertures called the lateral aperture and the median aperture, okay? And these both flow into and out these sides to the subarachnoid space. So that you've got cerebral spinal fluid bathing the outside of the brain, but still within a dural sac, okay? Um, what's next? So you don't want to forget that when you're dealing with this, we're also looking at the functions, all right? So we always want to remember our functions. So what is the purpose of cerebral spinal fluid, all right? So it's got a couple of different things going on. Because it's a liquid that things float in, it's going to reduce brain weight. by oh, around 97%. So I want you to think of yourself in a swimming pool. When you're on the ground, all right, standing beside the swimming pool, maybe you weigh 100 pounds. But when you get into the water, a two-year-old can pick you up because your weight has been reduced by the buoyancy of the water, okay? So things float and they weigh less, sort of. And that way, things, uh, the brain tissue doesn't get crushed by its own weight, okay? Um, also, when you put something in water, all right, it is going to um, cushion from trauma so that when you hit the back of your head, your brain kind of bounces around within the liquid, it's less likely to smack hard against the wall, okay? It's like trying to shoot a gun underwater versus shooting a gun on in the air. The bullet doesn't go nearly as far or as hard when it's underwater, okay? The other thing is that the CSF has access to a rich blood supply, okay? A lot of stuff is going to diffuse into the cerebral spinal fluid, okay? So that it can um, access the brain tissues, that everything that's, um, it, that's dissolved can access brain tissue. But also you can dump waste into the cerebral spinal fluid and it'll get back to the um, venous blood supply for recycling, okay? In terms of the components of CSF, all right, so it's gonna have more sodium, 
um, and more chloride ions than plasma. Okay, actually, so CSF components in comparison to blood plasma. So remember, plasma, interstitial fluid, cerebral spinal fluid, synovial fluid, they're all essentially the same fluid that flows from one spot to the next with some minor variations. So these are the variations for cerebral spinal fluid. It's got more sodium and more chloride than plasma, okay? But it has less potassium, calcium, and glucose and negligible amounts I'm gonna misspell this negligible very low amounts of proteins okay um, so in terms of how much you're making you can make and absorb a lot of cerebral spinal fluid so you're looking at about 500 milliliters a day that's made and resorbed, okay? At any time, you're gonna have about 100 to 160 milliliters present in the subarachnoid spaces and in the ventricles, okay? Which means the rest is being made and resorbed. So this is the active amount. Once you get above 160, you're gonna have problems. So you need to be able to resorb it. And again, we do that with those arachnoid feli. So um, in terms of the how this is all divided up, so about 40% is in the subarachnoid space. And I'm just gonna write it that way, subarachnoid space. Then about 30% is coming out of the ependymal cells at any one time. Okay, so that means um, mm, what I just wrote here in my notes doesn't make sense. I'll have to go back and look at that. Um, and then the rest is just circulating. Okay, so just kind of ignore what I wrote here because I'm not sure what I was writing in my notes and what I wanted to actually say about this. So let's just erase that before I say something wrong. Okay, so it's always circulating, all right? Always circulating, and it's circulating with the help of cilia that are on those ependymal cells, and then also pressure changes. Okay, um, and eventually all returns back to the venous blood supply. Via those arachnoid villi. All right, that dump into the dural sinuses, okay? Um, so we got cilia pressure changes. Oh, actually we should also um, put in um, the pulse, which is actually kind of a pressure change as well. So these are kind of going together, pressure changes, but I'm thinking about pressure changes in terms of um, gradients in that case. Anyway, uh, moving on. Let's, let's actually go and look at a picture right now. All right, so looking at this picture, so again, this is a sagittal view. And <clears throat> this is showing you cerebral spinal fluid here, here, all circulating here, also going around the arachnoid space, uh, subarachnoid space around, and all of that, okay? So we're gonna start up here. Now remember, this is the diencephalon region, okay? And the walls here are the thalamus and the hypothalamus, and then in the middle, you have the third ventricle. Up here, we're seeing where the septum pellucidum is, and then to the right and the left will be a lateral ventricle, one in each hemisphere. So then they're showing right here the choroid plexus. So the choroid plexus is this red ribbon 
and it's made up of those ependymal cells and it's gonna be secreting the cerebral spinal fluid that's gonna come into here and then drip down into the third ventricle. And you can see the third ventricle also has a choroid plexus for making um, cerebral spinal fluid. Now all the ependymal cells have cilia, so it's creating a current that's waving in this direction. The third ventricle is gonna come down through the cerebral aqueduct and then into the fourth ventricle, another area of choroid plexus. Now down here <clears throat> with that ventricle, we also have the median and lateral apertures. Okay, so here's the median one, up here is the lateral one. This allows the fluid to get out of this internal chamber and go out into the subarachnoid space here and here. All right, and there it can circulate up and around and going around the outside of the brain. Now you will see that I've got these little holes punched up, which are the, um, right here's where they wrote it out, the arachnoid felis. So when the cerebral spinal fluid is circulating here, some of it will jump up into here, some of it will just go straight. If it goes into here, there's the opportunity for the cerebral spinal fluid to diffuse across into the dermal sinus. In the dural sinus is where you have your venous blood supply, which is eventually gonna make it back to the heart. So you can see that it's going around in that direction up in here. It's also gonna come through and it's gonna wrap around the outside here and it'll go anteriorly and also in this direction where it can then be dumped into the arachnoid velus. Now over here, I've got your, I guess on the regular PowerPoint, it'll have the correct numbers on here. When I converted to a PDF, it messed up the numbers, but it's got everything labeled and showing um, directionality of flow. So this is an important pathway. And Anytime we have a pathway in anatomy and physiology, you want to pay attention to the pathway of flow and remember what direction it's going. All right, let's look at um, the choroid plexus a little bit closer. All right, here we are looking at the choroid plexus in a little bit more detail. All right, and what you see over here is the blood vessel, the capillary, and you can see the simple squamous epithelium simple squamous epithelium, the red blood cells in here. This is where you've got the membrane between the two, so this is like a basal laminum, okay? And then in gray, we have the ependymal cells, and what you will see is that the ependymal cells, which are not epithelial cells, these are nervous cells, not epithelium. They've got these little points here that are anchoring it to the basal lamina near the blood capillary so they don't detach. And then over here, I've got cilia, which is gonna wave and create a current. Now, everything in the blood vessel here has to leave. Now, we've got simple squamous epithelium, and you remember that its function is to allow simple, easy transport. Whether it's diffusion, osmosis, whatever, it's easier to get through a small flat cell than a big fat cuboidal cell. So it's gonna diffuse or move out from the blood and over to the ependymal cells. The ependymal cells are closely adhered to each other. See, they've got them sewn together and they're nice and big and fat, which means things don't move quickly through the ependymal cells. So the ependymal cells can decide what gets through and what doesn't. So it's gonna come into here and then the cerebral spinal fluid is going to come out of the ependymal cells. Now, cerebral spinal fluid is not just the liquid plasma. It also has glucose, oxygen, vitamins, ions like sodium, chloride, magnesium, and the ependymal cells are gonna help determine what the ratios of these things are going to be. Um, at this point in time, you can also allow some wastes to diffuse the other direction from high concentration to a lower concentration in the blood. Although most of the wastes are most likely going to leave with the cerebral spinal fluid as it goes to the arachnoid felis and then into the dural um, blood supply. Okay, all right, let's look at the next thing. All right, so this is just a different representation of that dural sinus. It's one of my favorite pictures though, so I'm throwing it in. And what I like is the way you see the dural sinus here, you've got the periosteal layer, you've got the meningeal layer, and then it separates so that you can see the two, and you can see the venous blood right here. 
and then the subarachnoid space here, and then the hole that's punching up through, which is the arachnoid villus, so that you can do diffusion into the sagittal sinus. This is incredibly important, okay? Because remember, you're making about 500 milliliters of cerebral spinal fluid, but you only have room for 100 to 160 milliliters. Okay, so that's your range depending on how big you are. Okay, so you gotta get rid of all the excess. If you do not get rid of the excess, the, the exorcist, the excess, you have hydrocephalus. Um, so this is, translates to water on the brain. And basically the pressure in here, no, excuse me, not the pressure there. The pressure in here starts to build up and it starts compressing on the brain tissue causing intense pain and headaches and can lead to brain damage and eventually death, okay? Different causes, we've got congenital, we've got trauma, we've got disease, we've got bad luck. Um, but anyway, so make sure you're draining your cerebral spinal fluid. All right, let's, uh, what are we gonna do next? Let's um, go and talk next about the blood-brain barrier. All right, so one of the most important things to remember about our brain is it's got a very narrow range for homeostasis. We have to be very careful with everything that's going in and coming out in order to maintain functioning. And it's not just fluid, so you've got cerebral spinal fluid, but you've also got this solutes. So this is gonna be ions, it's gonna be your sugars, proteins, Hormones and neurotransmitters, all of that has to be regulated with a very, very constant supply. Ooh, let's not forget oxygen and ATP energy. Very narrow range. So we've got two major entry points for things to get into the brain. The first one are the blood capillaries within the brain tissue. Okay. The other area is going to be, I'm going to just do this, blood capillaries that serve the choroid plexus. Okay. Anywhere where things can move from the blood into a tissue is a dangerous place because the blood circulates everything, including wastes, poisons, bacteria, viruses, plasmodium, all kinds of stuff, okay? So you have to be really careful with these entry points. Now, in terms of how delicate the range of homeostasis is, if homeostasis, if blood supply gets cut off, so let's say blood supply is cut off. You've got about 10 seconds before you lose consciousness. In one to two minutes, you're gonna have neural impairment. All right. And then four plus minutes, oh, my handwriting is so bad today. You'll have irreplaceable or irreversible brain damage. So you really do not have very long you can go before um, losing your blood supply really messes up homeostasis within your brain, all right? This is not much time at all, okay? I, I don't know why this is really bothering my handwriting today. I'm gonna have to put more effort into neatness. Four plus minutes, there, that looks better. Okay, now you have to have that constant, constant blood supply. But again, anytime you have that constant blood supply, you also have an entry point for pathogens. Let's actually, let's look at some pictures and then we're gonna talk about some of these dangers. Okay, <clears throat> so let's look up at this top picture right here. And what you see is this bizarre purple blood capillary and then this green little astrocyte. I just want you to notice the relationship between the two structures, okay? So the astrocyte is 
got all these little feelers right here. The blood capillary is made up of simple squamous epithelium. Now we're gonna take this little segment here and we're gonna make it bigger. So I've taken the capillary here and I've cut it transversely. So this is one simple squamous cell, one simple squamous cell, one simple squamous cell. And then I've got the little feet of the astrocytes. So here's one, um, on here I've got a neuron, um, here's a pericyte, here's a little another astrocyte. All right, so I've got this capillary that's being surrounded by other neural structures creating barriers, okay? Now, between the blood capillary cells, the simple squamous cells, I'm gonna put in extra tight junctions as well, okay? So <clears throat> to regulate what's getting in and out of the brain, you need to really have a lot of barriers in place to monitor things getting through, but you still want things to get through. So we're still using simple squamous epithelium, <clears throat> but we wanna make sure everything goes between, goes through the cell. So we're gonna put in a lot of tight junctions, which is going to uh, basically reduce the permeability. So here's the word, word. reduce the permeability between the cells so that things have to go through the cells they can't go between the cells. So this is really important for maintaining, for being able to monitor stuff before it goes through, okay? Now, the astrocytes themselves are important because they help to increase the barrier by basically releasing chemicals that increases the number of tight junctions here. So we have the tight junctions and then we have more of them as well. So now everything has to go between the cells. So we've got astrocytes helping to form a barrier, tight junctions helping to form a barrier. In AMP2, you're gonna learn about different types of capillaries, three different types. The one that we're gonna use here is called a continuous capillary that also helps to form a barrier. And then finally, a thick basal lamina. So there's this gooey stuff in between that also helps to create a really nice barrier. Okay, and that helps to regulate things going between them. Now we call this the blood-brain barrier, which I'm sure you've heard of. Let's look at the final picture a little bit bigger. I think this does a nice job of exemplifying what's going on here. So here is a simple squamous epithelial cell. Here is another simple squamous epithelial cell. Here is your astrocyte. Here is your astrocyte. This is representing the tight junctions here and here. If this was another cell, I might have a rinky-dink tight junction like this. So you can see really, really narrow. But instead, I've got this really big, thick, tight junction in here. I'm actually exaggerating it as well, okay? So that really prevents anything from going through except for tiny, tiny water-soluble agents that can slip through it. But it's got to be super, super tiny, okay? That prevents almost everything from getting through. Now things have to go through the cells, okay? So if you have something that is lipid soluble and can get through the plasma membrane, it can diffuse through following its concentration gradient. But we also remember with our plasma membrane use transport proteins. So glucose amino acids are gonna use a, a, a transport protein to get in and then to get out, which means this cell can think about, as much as cells think, what is going through, okay? Same thing over here, they're showing you receptor medio endocytosis. So this goes onto this receptor, the receptor forms endocy endocytosis vesicle, and then it can do exocytosis here, okay? And then you can just do um, a typical penocytosis type of structure, and then it goes, goes out, okay? Now, this whole area is a basal lamina, which has a charge to it, which is also gonna help regulate what 
goes out and then what gets bounced right back in. You'll study this a little bit more in AMP2. All right, let's look at it even closer or from a different view. All right, I like looking at these sorts of things with different types of pictures because I think they, sh they, they help visualize it in different ways. So here you've got the simple squamous epithelium of your capillaries. You can see a simple squamous cell. There's one here. If we come down here, you can see it there. You can see it there. You can see it there. And then you've got your astrocyte here with its little arms and legs that you're coming around and grabbing the section of the capillary. And you really, it basically is creating a wall or blanket around it. And this wall has like little woven areas or little gaps. So it's kind of like a crocheted shawl, a tight crocheted shawl draped around it. And so things would have to go through here directly. Some small things can get through this gap, okay? Now, let's move over to this particular picture. Oh, that wasn't supposed to happen. There it goes, okay. So again, the simple squamous cell here and here, you've got tight junctions here and here, here. Astrocyte here. Now, if you're looking at these things, this is gonna have to go through. So we've got a very small molecule, it's gonna go through here, and it's gonna be allowed through selectively. The astrocyte, because it's right here, can help regulate what goes in and out. So it's gonna let this glucose out. It's going to take this lipid molecule and let it go through out in between it, all right? Other things it can cause to stay in. It won't let it out, okay? So you've got interactions between this and the astrocyte that helps determine what actually makes it through the barrier. So for example, toxins are not allowed to go through here by the astrocytes. The astrocytes are like, no way, you're staying in there, okay? All right, so this blood-brain barrier is what we call, it's blech. It has selective permeability. This is not absolute barrier. You, you still gotta get stuff from the blood supply into the brain. So it needs to be selective in what it lets through, okay? So it keeps some things out and it lets some things through. So what gets through easily? Well, water, glucose, Amino acids, so some proteins, amino acids, very small ones, not big chains, all right? Um, certain ions, electrolytes pass through easily, okay? Anything made out of lipids is going to pass through easily because lipids can get through a plasma membrane, which is made of lipids through easily, okay? So if it's lipid soluble, it's going to pass easily. So that's your fats, fatty acids, and then also various tiny gases like oxygen, okay? CO2 can pass easily. This means small things that are lipid or either very small things or things that are lipid soluble um, can affect the brain. So alcohol affects the brain easily and quickly because it is a fatty acid. <laughs> um, glycerols, all right? So it passes through easily. Nicotine passes through easily. Various anesthetics, which is the whole point of anesthetics, pass through easily. All right. Um, hard, but can get through. Other things do not pass through so easily, but it, they can pass. Um, you just need a little bit more work, so sodium, potassium, chloride ions, interestingly enough, urea, and creatine. Um, so those can all get through. What, let's see, what's next? So we've got easily passes, hard but can get through. Um, let's see, cannot 
easily get through. So it's super hard to get through would be various metabolic waste products. Um, certain larger proteins. So let me actually, up here I wrote, where did I write? Let's actually cross this off and just put, make it clearer, tiny amino acids, okay? Down here, we're talking about, oops, longer chains. All right, they're too big to get through easily, okay? Some toxins, um, some drugs or pharmaceuticals have a really hard time getting through, okay? Um, like um, a lot of chemo drugs do not get through very easily. Uh, antibiotics do not get through easily, okay? Now, I said this was a selective, not an absolute barrier, okay? But some locations are more porous than others. All right, so this is a place, these are spots where that blood-brain barrier is either non-existent or very weakened, okay? So either non-existent Or weakened okay so it's more um, fluid okay places where this is really important would be like the hypothalamus because if you um, for example never mind that um, what do I want to say about the hypothalamus the hypothalamus is your master gland that's regulating the whole body so it needs to know what is going on in the blood at all times without having to work hard at it. So you remove the blood-brain barrier around the hypothalamus so that it can do its job. Uh, another place would be in the brain stem, especially things like its vomit center. So if you eat something that's poisonous, you want your blood to tell the brain stem that it's gotten something poisonous in it so that you start vomiting as quickly as possible, okay? The other thing is in the fetus and uh, newborns, the blood-brain barrier um, is not complete, which means anything that is in the fetus or newborn's brain up to a few years after birth can pass across into the brain tissue very easily. So heavy metals, mercury, lead, um, poisons, or... Um, Drugs can pass through their brains very easily, okay? Um, and then you've got all kinds of problems, okay? So what are the cons of your blood-brain barrier? Um, well, certain medicines cannot cross. is probably one of the biggest ones that we face. So certain antibiotics, certain cancer meds can't cross the blood-brain barrier. So then we're trying to figure out how do you treat a brain tumor? How do you treat a bacterial infection in the brain if you can't get the antibiotics to it, okay? The other thing is that you can damage this blood-brain barrier. Um, any kind of trauma or inflammation can cause degradation of the blood-brain barrier itself and then things can leak through and then you can get pathogens into the brain that you don't want there, okay? All right, let's look at one last picture. All right, a couple of years ago, I came across this picture in Nature, um, which is a science journal. And what I like is it's showing the blood-brain barrier structure right here. So this is the blood-brain barrier versus the structure of what you consider the gut-brain. So you'll study the gut-brain more in um, AMP2. But there's a lot of similarities in how it's structured and how it deals with creating a um, safe internal environment while still interacting with the external environment. And so what I like here is you've got the blood vessel, you've got the cells right here of your blood capillaries, and then you've got the astrocytes here, okay, which is creating this barrier. When you have trauma, inflammation, damage, you basically start to break down the astrocytes, okay? 
And then you also can break down tight junctions and some of the structural integrity of the, epi of the um, simple squamous cells here. I don't know why they represent them as cuboidal up here, but anyway. Um, and then things that are in the blood can start leaking into the brain tissue. Things that shouldn't be in the brain tissue and that can increase inflammation and damage. Over in the gut brain over here, you have what we call enteric glial cells, which are basically a type of, they're not astrocytes, but they're very similar, okay? And then you've got the epithelial cells here, and then you've got the lumen of your intestines, all right? So this is where you would have your food floating by. And so you've got this really nice, tight junctions, nice columnar cells, the glial cells monitoring the environment. But for example, if you start um, traumatizing your gut by taking too many NSAIDs or um, developing celiac or gluten enteropathies, that can start damaging these um, cells right here. Also, that starts to damage these glial cells. And then again, you've got things that start to slip into the inside of the body, which can then stimulate um, autoimmune disorders. Okay, I think this is kind of a cool slide. So we're going to go ahead and stop right there and you can move on to the next video.